Hi there, you are listening to the Guitar Speak podcast. My name is Matt Wakeling and this is the show where I get to speak to leading guitarists and guitar figures from all around the world. Thank you so much for joining me. Now today I'm really excited to bring to you my interview with wonderful Sydney-based jazz guitarist Tim Rollinson. Now Tim was a founding member of the acid jazz pioneering band Dig from the mid-90s. I love that band and uh, since then Tim's gone on to release a bunch of fantastic solo albums including his latest Old New Blues. Right now we're hearing a little bit of his version of Blue Monk. The album has a fantastic mix of old and new influences and uh, underpinning it all is Tim's beautifully phrased and presented jazz guitar. But let's head straight on to my conversation. All right, Tim Rollinson, welcome to the Guitar Speak podcast. Matt, thanks very much for having me on. Great, great to have you. You've had um, you've had an amazing career. It's spanned quite a while in in the Australian jazz, blues, and and contemporary scene. So I'm keen to talk about lots of stuff. In fact, your your latest album, Old New Blues. Um, is fantastic so i really want to dig into that but given we've got a little bit of time um it'd be great to talk about your career leading up to the new album as well sure well it's funny it's funny you should talk about career because you know being a mainly a jazz guitar player although like i've sort of delved into all sorts of things because i'm kind of very interested in all sorts of music and you know whenever the opportunities come up i've sort of i've done other things um but it's kind of like some quote I was heard the other day. It's like, you know, you live life forward, but but you can only really kind of judge it or, or sort of piece it together in in reverse or by looking back. And I never would have thought that, that I had a career if, in my own head because it's, it's, always, it's always stop, start, and I'm kind of like a freelance musician for, for the large part. Yeah. But then when you do look back, you go, oh, yeah, okay, I did that, that, that. And then I suppose that adds up to, to something, you know, in the end. Um. But yeah, so I kind of spent, I was basically, I started life as a classical guitar player, just taking lessons, um, which sort of taught me the basics of reading. And then I kind of moved into sort of a a jazz direction. I kind of studied that to a degree. I played it. Um, In the sort of, after that, I kind of went into more kind of, almost like an indie rock sort of thing. um, But at the same time, I was was doing kind of freelance work, sort of functions and sort of uh, all sorts of different things, which was kind of unusual for the people in that area too. Um, and then sort of, you know, then, yeah, sort of spent the 90s with the band Dig. So that was kind of like the closest thing to a regular job uh-huh. yep. that I've ever had. And that that was, you know, I guess the heyday of that was about six six or seven years and, and with, with a sort of lead up and then a kind of... Uh, a sort of a tailing out at the end where it it wasn't as full on. Um, sure, but sure. But the band still kind of actually hasn't officially broken up, but it's, we haven't done much in the last few years. Yeah. yeah and then, there's, you know, so there's all sorts of bits and pieces that kind of add up to something, but you don't really sort of see it as a as a whole thing or a pattern until maybe a little later. For sure, for sure. And as you say, as a freelance musician, you're, you're looking for the next job or you're developing your next project. As you go, it's it's well. That's right, and I've always... never been a big, I've never been a good hustler. Um, so I guess I'd probably missed out on quite a few things that I could have done, but just um, like just selling myself has always sure. been yeah, yeah. just yeah. A, diffi- a difficult process. And um, it's so a... a lot of times I'm waiting for that phone to call, or you know, obviously these days for that text to come through and just kind of kick me off in some other direction. Um, it is amazing though. Um, I'm actually not much of one for kind of for the spiritual side of things, but it's weird how sometimes things just kind of bunch up. Like sometimes I sort of, when I think about 
other musicians and I think about, wow, that musician is so good. I would love to play with that musician. Um, it's funny how often, like, within a period of time, something happens and I get a message from that person, you know. So, um, yeah, as I say, I don't – I'm not sort of suggesting that um, that thing is actually – a, a possibility, but it, but it's weird how, um, you know, when you kind of focus your energy. As I say, I'm not a big hustler, so I have actually spent periods of time where the you know work's been pretty thin on the ground. Sure. Um, let Let's back up a little then. So you said you started as a classical guitar player. How old were you when you started playing? Um, I was kind of uh, sort of in the middle there. I wasn't particularly young. Uh, I, I I was ten or eleven when I started. Yeah. Um, I originally, um, I, I was just sort of always like a big music fan as a kid. Like I would just love listening to music on the radio. <clears throat> My parents had a, you know, like a collection. It wasn't a huge collection, but it was, it was sort of, it was, it, it was a good collection. I mean, my dad was very much into Frank Sinatra and big bands and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, my mum was a little bit more on the sort of, you know, Dionne Warwick and Motown singers. And um, there was uh, Burt Bacharach was, was another favourite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but, you know, all that stuff, like, it's, um, it sort of has a certain cheesy element to it. But it's, it's really great music as well, you know, so it's a good... Um, I obviously used to listen to the radio a lot. And um, I'm actually of that generation where I remember uh, Double J starting up oh yeah wow and that was kind of like a revelation um because all of a sudden there was all this music that um you know didn't really have access to before that yeah yeah and of course you know there wasn't you know this is like way before the internet and um so i don't think you can underestimate the effect of that radio station of course it kind of became triple j after a while mm -hmm. and got and went national but it was um it was incredible um incredible way just to sort of hear all this stuff. I remember hearing all sorts of things like Frank Zappa, Jean-Luc Ponty, um, Marvishn Orchestra, John McLaughlin, all that sort of stuff, um, which was a big influence, um, just basically came through that radio station. Um, I, I originally sort of, well, as I said, I was, I was a big fan of just listening and I hadn't really sort of had much of a kind of, um, like there was nobody saying, "Oh, why don't you play? If you like music, why don't you play?" Because nobody else in the family actually played an instrument. Uh, apparently, Mum used to play the piano when she was when she was young, but but she'd sort of long since given that up and, mm -hmm. and hadn't really sort of taken it up again. Um, but um, my uh, family had sort of emigrated from England, and at one point, my mum and my brother and I sort of went back there because she was homesick. And wanted to sort of, you know, go back to England and visit the family, and sort of actually decide whether we should go back or not because we'd been away three or four years at that point, and I think that she was thinking maybe we should, you know, go back again. Um, so Dad stayed in Australia because he didn't want to give up his job and said, "Look, you go back, make a decision, and then if you come back, then I'm not going to lose my job." So that was done. Now. My mum's a great procrastinator. We ended up staying back in England for about almost a year. Like uh -huh. I went, I went through a whole year at school there. Wow. When we came back, <clears throat> there was a you know there was a classical guitar sitting in the living room, um, which Dad had sort of bought. He bought a book <laughs> and a guitar, and basically hadn't done anything with it. <laughs> so it was just sitting there, and I thought, oh wow, you know, like music. Um, so that was kind of like the reason for. I mean, of course, I love the guitar, but I, it wasn't like. I sort of, at first, it wasn't like, oh, I really need to go and buy a guitar and play it. It was yeah, like, okay. oh, wow, there's a guitar. And I just sort of picked it up and started sort of messing around. And then, you know, mum said, oh, well, you know, like if you if you really want to do it, let's, you know, send you off to lessons because I can't, I can't tell you anything about it. Um, and then, you know, like after that, I had a really good friend um, at sort of late primary school and early high school who who was actually quite a good, competent musician. He played clarinet, piano, and he eventually took up the electric bass. Um, so we were kind of discovered a lot of stuff together. So, um, um, so that, yeah, that's basically the story of the beginnings of it all. Yeah, um, yeah. 
you know, it was it was kind of the jazz sort of influence sort of seeped in as I um, as I started learning. You know, once I got past the beginnings of the instrument, I was yeah. sort of, you know, I mean, it's hard to know when all these things start. But I do I do remember I bought a um, Joe Pass album um, in a local record store, which was um, called Intercontinental, and that was like a huge um, a huge thing for me. It, it's funny because I I didn't look. This is an album I had when I was kind of like a teenager, and of course, you know, as time goes on, it was on vinyl, of course, and you know, you move house about you know twenty times <laughs> over, you know, over your sort of twenties and thirties and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, share households, parties, whatever. Um, a lot of the a lot of the albums I had just sort of disappeared, and I don't even know where where some of them went. Um, that was one of those. It's and then one day I was just only a couple of years ago I sort of thought. Well, that album, I, I recall that album so so vividly, um, and I kind of searched for it to buy it. Couldn't find it anywhere, but then it, it came up as a some sort of legal download, I guess. So I just kind of grabbed it and um, listened to it, and I thought, wow, there is so much in there that the little voice and little musical voice in my head refers to quite often, like. It it was wow, obviously like wow. a, a huge influence. Like yeah, there, was, yeah, got stuck there were in things there. in there. I thought, you know, sometimes I'm playing and I'm hearing something, and and there it is. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Um, so it was it was kind of really interesting to revisit that album. I think that was a huge influence. That's amazing. So when you first had the record, how, how old were you then? Um, look, it's hard to remember exactly. I I, I would have imagined I was probably twelve or thirteen, perhaps. Okay. And were you trying it to learn? It was definitely the songs? after I'd started. Playing. Yeah. Okay. Were you trying to learn this stuff? Pardon. What was that? Were, were you trying to learn the songs at the time? Um. Yes and no, because it was like a foreign language to me. It was yeah. kind of like I, I loved the sound of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, in a sense, it'd be like listening to somebody speaking French and going, "Wow, that's a beautiful sounding language." Uh-huh. Yeah. But I have no idea what it means or how how you get there. You know, like um, I had nobody to kind of re- interpret those sounds for me, I guess. And I'd, I'd sort of do my best. Um, what one thing that I, another thing that I do remember in terms of that translation thing was, um, another album that was really influential was I went, I went to the record store and I actually, you know, like I probably shouldn't admit it, but I bought an album based on the cover. Um, and I probably had, <laughs> I probably had listened to it in the shop. I think but, we've all done that. Yeah. <laughs> But the album was, um, it was a Yes album called Fragile. Oh, yeah, which wow. I think it was a bit of a classic. And yeah. um, I, um, and the, you know, basically the first thing on it, like there's like a, you know, there's like a backward guitar sound or something that kind of ramps up. And then, and then this classical guitar comes in and with harmonics, you know. Um, and it does like a sort of, like a little kind of chord melody rundown. And then, and then the sort of the groove kicks in. And I remember, like, for the first time, I was kind of heard that, and I thought, that sort of sounds like what I'm playing, because, you know, I was, I was playing these sort of classical pieces, not at, not at a, you know, not at an expert level, but I was sort of doing my best. And um, and I listened to that and I thought, ah, that sounds kind of like what I'm doing. And that was the first time, I think, that it was like the window that sort of opened. Okay, okay. Opened slightly, and, um, and I thought, oh, okay, so what I'm doing... It's kind of a little bit like that, maybe. And so I kind of like I worked that I'm, I worked most of the intro out by ear, um, because the sounds were familiar to me. And 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 bit by bit, I sort of started learning some more chords and things. And I think sometimes you have to, you almost have to play something to be able to recognise it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because like everything was new, everything yeah, was right. so new, like. Um, I was kind of listening to things in, in a general level, like like a lot of people do. Like I was, it was like the whole song or the whole thing, or listening to the the harmony of it, but not really sort of trying to work out what the harmony was. Sure. But just enjoying enjoying the sounds and enjoying the sound of the instruments and the sound of the voices. And then suddenly I was kind of like, oh, okay, so it's made up of all these bits, you know. And then I suddenly started, you know, at that point I started hearing what, what the bass was doing and what the drums were doing, and 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 that kind of so, um, but the funny thing was, I actually had a teacher. Uh, the original teacher that I had was a guy who, um, who was a Spanish guy who played 
flamenco and classical. And then he left he left the um he left the business and this other guy called Paul Pallister took over. And Paul Pallister was actually um he was a classical guitarist, but he was also a jazz player and also like a kind of he loved sort of Chet Atkins and that sort of thing. Um but he was a little bit um like once he once he came in and once I found out that he wasn't just a classical guy, I was like, "Well, I've been listening to this Joe Pass stuff," and and he's like, "No, just keep practicing classical." <laughs> I'm going, but don't you play? J-? No, just keep on. You know, like I'm not going to show you that stuff. And I thought, oh, okay. So I kind of like I just sort of chipped away at him over you know over months, and eventually he um he kind of started showing me some stuff. But I, I'm to this day I, I don't know why he was so resistant to that, but maybe it was. <laughs> Maybe it's because he was just being paid to teach me classical and right. thought that that was what he was meant to be doing. Um, but yeah, so so it's funny. I kind of had access to to a real vast knowledge there, but in a way, it was sort of bizarrely closed off to me. Um, but yeah, so um, it was kind of like when I started playing some stuff. I think um, after a while, he sort of thought, "Oh well, I'm not going to be able to stop this, so I'll just I'll kind of go with it." That's interesting. Did, and did he have the facility for it? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, he was, um, I mean, I think he's actually still still with us. Um, he, he he moved up to Queensland. He was actually, um, he actually taught classical at New South Wales Con for a while, uh, like a few years after when I met him. Okay. Um, and he was also like a, a club musician, you know, and so he, he backed acts and he sort of, Traveled, traveled around, and um, you know, as I say, he was quite good at that sort of country rock style, and he he could play jazz, and you know, he could read really well, and he could play classical sort of uh, guitar, and he kind of moved up to near the Twin Town sort of area. Oh, okay, yep. And I think uh, there was a lot of work up there. So this is like a few years, probably even after I'd stopped having lessons from him. Um, but um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, to this day, I don't, I don't exactly know why he was <laughs> resistant. Because I mean, if somebody came to me and said, and you know, and said, "Oh, look, I really want to learn jazz guitar, but my mum says I should do classical," I'd be like, "Yeah, no, we can do both," you know. Yeah, sure. But, you know, if you, because well, I always think like you know, the most inspiring thing for a student is to basically teach them some of what they want to know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because yeah. otherwise, it just gets, it's just it's just kind of boring and and, yeah. and repetitive, you know, and. You, you're at risk of losing their interest, and, and maybe they'll drift away. You know. Yeah. Um, so if somebody's enthusiastic about something, you, you sort of, you really is. You know, your role in a sense is to kind of encourage that as much as possible. Definitely, definitely. So here you are. So you're getting, you're finally getting some jazz lessons, and you you must be getting some facility in the instrument. And interesting that you're, you're probably hearing a lot of stuff at home, like your own collection and your, your parents' record collection would have had some interesting harmony. Even the Bacharach stuff was uh, compared well, to a lot of pop music. pretty music, really, isn't yeah. it? I mean, it's, um, there's some really interesting composition stuff in there. Yeah. I mean, it's. I think it's interesting that I kind of got attracted to, you know, they sort of call it prog rock now, I guess, but mm-hmm. I, don't rem- I don't think it was called that back in the day. Um, and, but yet, I can't really can't remember what it was called. You know? Yeah, right. Um, but um, yeah, so I kind of went through a little bit of that phase. Yep. Um, I also look. It was like everybody else too. I mean, like really, everything that was on. I mean, I, I remember going through a bit of a slave period. I remember. Yeah, yeah. I remember Deep Purple was a favourite. Funnily enough, um, Led Zeppelin was a big thing, but for some reason, I never quite sort of. Kind of, I, I, it was really a bit later that I sort of realised how good they were. Um, I think I had one, one album which is the acoustic album, and I sort of remember thinking, oh, this is yeah. I, I was kind of into the electric guitar a bit more at that point. Yeah. Um, so I kind of dismissed them to a degree just based on that one album, which is a funny thing. Um, but yeah, so there was all um, there was a lot of that sort of progressive rock stuff sort of led me. At plus the interest in jazz kind of sort of led me towards a kind of you know that sort of the sort of fusion world I guess to sure. a degree like yeah, yeah, yeah. but more in the time when it was kind of like fuse actual fusions you know it was like funk music meets jazz mm-hmm. meets meets classical meets uh, Latin meets whatever 
Um, I was never really a big fan of kind of 80s fusion yep. so much and that sort of thing. Um, I, was, I was kind of more into the, the, the raw, the more raw sort of early stuff. Um, but um, yeah, so I went, so, so, so my interest sort of took me in that direction. And then um, the next big influence, I guess, was um, at high school, there was a guy called Carrie Bennett who actually just saw just recently, he lives in Armadale now, he formed a, um, he wanted to try and form a big band at high school. And um, like I was playing guitar, but at, but at high school I was kind of, because there was, no, there was nothing other than a classical orchestra, um, I kind of took up the cello and I played some flute. And when it came to uh, musical stuff at high school, it was basically cello and flute. Um, and so the, Carrie decided he wanted to form a big band. And he was kind of like a charismatic sort of guy and, you know, people kind of heard his idea and go, yeah, yeah, let's do it. So we sort of rehearsed. And first of all, I was, I was actually on flute. Uh, funnily enough, um, the other flute player was Sandy Evans, who was a oh wow, she's a huge kind of you know name on the Australian jazz world. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she was just beginning at that point too. I mean, she wasn't just beginning playing flute, but she was just beginning in terms of like using the flute in a kind of jazz sort of way. Right. Um, so, um, but you know, she was just way. But I was just like a kind of a tinkerer on the flute and. I really didn't know what I was doing there, except I just wanted to be involved because it wasn't like classical music. It was something different. Yeah, sure. And um, so then, but then the guitarist sort of left and, and I sort of said, oh, look, I, I play guitar. You know, maybe I could I could take over. And it was like, yeah, a little flute boy wants to play guitar. You know? <laughs> um, but I sort of somehow got the opportunity and yeah. uh, because I could read, you know, um, we had some somebody found some arrangements somewhere so we we're kind of playing that stuff so I kind of managed to slot in there and kind of do do the job and you know that was that was, I much preferred doing that and yeah, um, nice. but that 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 band you know it's kind of long story short that band after a period of time Carrie sort of couldn't really take it any further so he um when he'd been to um at primary school one of his teachers was like an amateur jazz piano player. His name was John Spate. And he told John that he had this kind of thing going. At, this is at Manly Boys High School. Um, and he just, he'd taken it as far as he could go with his sort of, you know, his knowledge. I mean, he was only obviously only a teenager himself. And John went, oh, you know, why don't you come and rehearse at, at the primary school on a Saturday and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll just see if we can work something out. And that, and that that sort of group of people sort of like slowly morphed into a thing that eventually became known as the Young Northside Big Band, and we went to um, we ended up sort of you know getting getting quite good o over a few years, and we supported uh, the Mercer Ellington Orchestra, the Count wow. Basie Orchestra, wow, that's awesome. Dave, Dave Brubeck Group. Um, we Count Basie recommended us to um, the guy that ran the Monterey Jazz Festival in California, so in in 1979, we um, we all kind of jumped on a Qantas flight and went to um, um, California, to Monterey in California, wow, which is sort of south of San Francisco. <laughs> um, and that was just that was an amazing experience. Yeah. Um, so you're on electric but, by now, um, obviously in in the big band. What are you playing? Yeah. Well, I got electric sort of reasonably early like a couple of years after i started because as 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 i said we i had this friend uh peter sneesby at um and he he kind of um took up the electric bass and and it was kind of like oh we should you know we should form a band or whatever <laughs> and um you know this is kind of uh we were both in the beatles and and rolling stones as, so you know i'm kind of adding all this stuff as i go but as i said look i was totally sort of um eclectic in my taste and so so it was Peter and, um, you know, so we'd sort of sit around with, like he had this great Ramsey Lewis album. He had um, the Beatles White album. I just remember going to his place and we'd listen to all those albums. Um, Jeff Beck Blow by Blow was another mm -hmm. favourite. And um, so I, I kind of thought, oh, yeah, I've got to get myself an electric guitar. So there was this kind of old shop in BY, um, which was, you know, the area that I lived in. And it was called the Quodo Music Centre. 
and um, it was like an organ shop, you know, the old school sort of yeah, um, yeah. home organs. <laughs> yep. But there was a couple of guitars hanging on the wall, and one of them was a, it was like a, a copy of a black Les Paul, yep. and it nice. was a uh, Tempo brand. Oh, yeah, and I remember I, those. I remember it cost $125, and it was like, how am I ever going to find $125? <laughs> yeah, man. So, you know, by a process of, you know, pleading and sort of <laughs> doing doing some jobs here and there and, you know, sort of like birthdays and Christmases for about, you know, 25 years, yeah. um, <laughs> I sort of ended up with this with this guitar. And it was, um, yeah, and, and Peter sort of, um, his dad worked for Qantas, and he kind of, on one of his trips overseas, he he grabbed an old like a it was a brand new precision bass. We're talking about in this is wow, back, yeah, and um and brought that back and so and so we kind of like yeah we just sort of played and I think what, one of my great achievements in life I think is um, sitting playing we're kind of doing this kind of bluesy stuff and I stumbled on the the blues scale you know and and I sort of went okay that's it. <laughs> I've unlocked I've, the key is yes. I've unlocked the secrets to the yes, universe absolutely I, yeah. <laughs> but yeah no that was an amazing find you know and I, I'm kind of um, yeah I, I didn't I didn't sort of um, find it in a book I, I was very sort of I was very happy you know like it was like yeah. wow okay so I'm starting to get this scale thing you know it's like these notes work and, and you know almost anything you do with them yeah I yeah. mean of course that's that was a pretty limited uh, view of what you could do, but it sort of that was another major point where I just went right. Okay, these notes are the ones, and yeah. you know, and, and we work from that. Very cool. Now, when you so you're getting towards the end of high school. Uh, after high school, did you go into any formal music studies, or you just kept gigging? Or what, yeah, what yeah, I um, yeah. So so I kind of like you know, sort of, that was like the school rock band happened and all that kind of stuff. And this other band, the Northside big band sort of kind of went on, it was, was doing gigs like as a, as a big band kind of toured a bit and, um, did some gigs in the local RSL clubs. And cause you know, we were playing like, we were kids playing, um, kind of old music really, you know, yeah. it was funny because even then, like obviously Glenn Miller was like, you know, almost half a century yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, we did have a bit of an audience cause some of the local people, you know, at that that point where, you know, like the elderly people were still quite, you know, fond of that sort of music. So we kind of did did some gigs with that band and and I started doing a little bit of um, kind of wedding stuff, I guess, you know, yeah. like, but, yeah. but more on the jazz side of things, like not so much the cover band sort of thing. Um, so, um, yeah, we're kind of, so, doing, and then I was sort of, yeah, and then I kind of auditioned for the con and got into the jazz course there. So I actually went, did a year of uni because I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do, you know, with my life at that point. Um, and I sort of did that and I kind of thought, I, I just didn't feel that my heart was in it. So after after one year, I, I sort of thought, oh, well, I'll defer and I'll audition for the con because a couple of friends of mine had done that. It seemed like a good a good thing to do. Um, but I got in and I thought, oh, okay, well, look, I'll um, actually I took a year off and I practiced. That's what I, that's what happened. To, uh, like I did one year of uni, then I took a year off and just practiced and sort of tried to get my stuff together. And at the end of that year, I um, auditioned for the con and I got in. And kind of that was the end of uni, really. I, I just went, I just did the con, and then I sort of. And then I sort of tried to make my way as a as a jazz guitarist in Sydney, which yeah. you know, uh, obviously I wasn't that concerned about money because that wasn't really the best career choice in me in, in, in lots of ways. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why that teacher didn't want to show you jazz. Maybe it was a career yeah, guidance. That, that's <laughs> right. He was try He was looking out for my for my best interest. <laughs> what did you take from studying so intensely at, at the con at that time? Um, well, I learned. You know, so much. I mean, um, it's just trying to sort of piece it all together. I mean, I guess it was um, one one of the great influences there was a piano player called Roger Frampton, who was one of the greats of Australian jazz. Yeah, yeah. He um, he just he just captured my imagination, like as well as the musical side of things. He just completely captured my imagination. He was just he um, 
he was kind of like just such an energetic guy. He he had a really dark, sort of weird, funny sense of humor. Um, he kind of, you know, he'd sort of jump from the piano to kind of playing the saxophone, he played the saxophone at a really high level. He was into the avant-garde. He kind of, he started, he hit the piano and sort of said, that's music, you know, and he introduced the whole class, the whole, a whole load of new music. Um, and it sort of kind of solidified a lot of things because he was, he was a guy who was a brilliant musician. He could have made it in any field of music. Um, but he chose to kind of basically to play um, a form of music that, you know, well, I, I guess you'd call it art music. Um, so there was that sort of, so that was one influence. And then, of course, there was, then there was the technical side of things where I kind of learned a lot about harmony and about sort of scales and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then you kind of like, and then a huge thing was just meeting people of like mind from all over. So, you know, you'd have a, you'd, you'd sort of have a, a year of people. I, I can't remember exactly how many people. I, I'm kind of just guessing or remembering that it was about 20 people, maybe of all different instruments. But mm-hmm. of course, I still see those people around and I still play with them. And it's like a little family in a way. So I think it was uh, great, you know, in all sorts of ways. Um, George Goller was there teaching at the time. Yeah, wow. Um, so he was, um, you know, he kind of unlocked a few little gave me a few tips and secrets and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I don't know, I think I just learned about structure of music and I, I sort of, I knew that, I mean, I have to backtrack and basically go, this sounds like I'm sort of powering along, but you know what, I've, I'm a lazy person at heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it sounds like maybe I was just practicing all the time, but yeah. that's not the case. You know, like I was doing a lot of stuff and I was practicing but, you know, that was why I kind of reached that sort of, that point, I suppose, where I was like, I'm not exactly sure what I'd do. Maybe I'll just go to uni and do English and, you know, maybe I'll become an English teacher or something like that. You know, I really just didn't have a clue. I was kind of fairly directionless. But I think the con, after doing that and meeting all those other players, musicians of my age group, I was thinking, wow, this music's pretty interesting, isn't it? You know, and... um I didn't really look back after that, you know. Um, sort of, I just kind of continued to meet people um, and, and you know, f- form bands and play with people. And um, But as I say, um, just because um, I had that pretty varied background listening-wise, I did sort of tend to play in a few original rock bands and that kind of thing. Um, I guess what you'd call indie bands, but I don't know if that's, I don't think that's what they were called then. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, and I kind of, you know, there's a, the sort of eighties was like a pretty interesting time because it was, it was still possible to find gigs all over the place. Um, you know, so if you were a kind of a young rock band, um, or an original band, singer, songwriter or anything of that nature, you know, you could play, you could find at least a gig a week. Um, even if you weren't that good, or you know, like you, you could support somebody. You could, you could, um, you could go into a pub. You could, you know, it was like, um, and and the whole pub rock scene was just absolutely sort of going off. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, there's a lot of great Australian music as a result from that time. Absolutely, yeah. I um I didn't start seriously gigging till the early '90s, which I feel like I really missed that boat. But I've got an older brother who's six years older, and I just remember in the '80s every week he was going to see some amazing band just in the local pubs and. Uh, oh, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Incredible. Can I um, if I can fast forward to the early '90s and and share one of my yep. great musical regrets? I went to the basement, uh, famous yep. little club not far from the con, actually. Um, I went to see Doug Williams. Rex Go was playing guitar. Uh, I went with a mate of mine who was getting lessons off Sonny Da Silva, the percussionist. And uh, Doug Williams sets finishing up. It's about one in the morning. And, and Doug says, well, hang around. We've got a new band called Dig coming up next. Uh, stick around. And, of course, Tim, one in the morning, I'm, I'm a bit... I'm a bit dozy, so I think, oh man, I'm just going to go home. So I missed seeing Dig in uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> in one of your early. Ba- I've seen you guys since. It was made up for me when you guys reformed in in later years. But 
I always regretted, um, yeah, seeing you guys early on because it wasn't long after I missed that gig that, um, uh, yeah, I got your records and um, and loved that stuff. So, for, for, yeah, well, I mean, I'll, tell me about well, that. Okay. I mean, I think we've all got those kind of regrets about. Um, <laughs> you know, not going out one night, or and then yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll answer your question, but I, I always remember like um, in sometime in the nineties and on a tour with Dig, we were at the North Sea Jazz Festival, and um, I, um, I I was just like I was just sort of all day just walking around, seeing all this amazing music, and and kind of got back to the hotel, and I was just like, I think somebody said um, might have even been Toby. Paul, who was there with a different band, we sort of arrived at the same time, and and I'm, he's like, "Oh, do you want to maybe have a drink in the bar?" And I'm like, "Oh, no, I've just been walking around all day. Like, I, I've heard about twenty bands, and all of them are just mega famous, and just every every set of music has just been like mind blowing. <laughs> um, I think I might just get some, you know, get some shut eye. I'll just go to bed. I like go to breakfast the next day and, and say, Toby, I said, oh, "How are you going? Did you?" Have a drink. He goes, oh yeah, I went to the bar, and guess who was jamming with the band there? George Benson. Oh, no he said way. he played like an hour and a half of bebop. Like this oh. is when when Benson was, you know, obviously just uh, like still doing the kind of. Well, you know, it was in the nineties, so it's kind of like he was he was like George Benson, and then he was like George Benson twenty years on from George Benson kind yeah, of thing. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. but he wasn't really playing that many jazz gigs, obviously. That's like, right. Sort of, yeah. He'd, he'd been like, you know, the amazing George Benson doing kind of disco stuff. Yeah, and, that and, and kind of you know, thing, yeah. Yeah, and, he, and like to actually have heard him like still in his prime, um, just, you know, playing. You know, I just thought, <laughs> oh, all right, so it's one of those moments anyway. Uh, but um, You're making me feel better. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so what was the question? <laughs> well, just the, the, I guess, the beginning of Dig. So for, for our yeah, listeners yeah, yeah. who weren't alive then or, or were not, um, not up on it. So Dig Directions in Groove were an early 90s Australian band. And you guys were really on the front edge of that whole acid jazz explosion. I remember um, there was you guys, there was Ronnie Jordan, like the UK kind of stuff I was listening to a lot of as well. Um, yeah. So tell me about, I guess, the formation of Dig. And I guess I also want to know, did you guys feel like you were on the edge of something new happening? Um. Well, yes, but um, look, can I just quickly sort of just put the transition in there, absolutely, if you don't mind? Cause, absolutely. Because I was going to say that um, I kind of reached another of those sort of watershed moments in life. It was like at the end of the 80s. I kind of done a few different bands, and I sort of ended up playing a bit with Lewis Tillett, who maybe some of your listeners would know. He's, he's pretty big. And, um, and then the Black Eyed Susans, who are still kind of going yeah, today. Yeah. Um, so I kind of did... A little bit of stuff with Lewis and the, the Ego Trippers from Hell Band I, I played in, and and then um, it was kind of Black by Susans, and then they kind of relocated to Melbourne after I sort of spent a year with them, and um, and I kind of I was doing a few other things here, and 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 I kind of just I kind of reached this point it was like right at the end of the eighties, and I was like, wow, what what have I been just doing? Like you know, I I, I, was, I was kind of like didn't have a lot of stuff on and I was kind of like looking back thinking this is really weird like I've gone from wanting to be a jazz guitarist to playing in all these different bands and and the reason I did it was just to give myself some some kind of um like a contemporary sort of grounding like I was listening to a lot of old music and I just wanted to play some new stuff and I wanted to write some things um but I kind of like sort of reached this point where it's like well I'm just not exactly sure what's next so I thought I really, and at that point I met this uh, bass player Paul Meter, who sort of like heard me play some jazz. I kind of just was doing a couple little jazz things, and I think I just sort of ended up playing with him one day. And he's like, "Ah, oh, I've got all these little gigs around town. Like, you know, do you want to do some?" I'm yeah, yeah. Look, I'm really hungry for it because this is the kind of music that I always thought that I was going to be playing, mm-hmm. and and so we we were doing sort of various all sorts of little gigs. Um, this is like very early 90s. And through one of those little gigs, I kind of met Scott Saunders, who was the keyboard player oh, okay. in D. Yeah. And we just, um, we literally met on this gig and it was at, it, 
what used to be the hip-hop club in Oxford Street, Darlinghurst. Okay. And we were kind of like playing a like jazz duo and Scott was kind of experimenting a bit with vocals. Um, and we just kind of like played before something happened. And I think it, it was probably just playing before a DJ, perhaps. Um, just providing some kind of live a live um, set um, before the nightclub sort of kicked in. And we were kind of like both sitting there in this nightclub thinking, you know what, there's all this really interesting music going on um, which seems to centre around nightclubs. And and I think at the late 80s, early 90s, a lot a lot of stuff that people go, oh, yeah, electronic dance music, or acid jazz, or, you know, hip-hop, like, boring. You know? <laughs> but then it was kind of interesting, uh, as, you know, at that time, because it was kind of quite, new, it was like all this new stuff was filtering through. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it did seem to be revolving around nightclubs. And there was a, like a live element was creeping into the nightclubs. Whereas a lot, a lot of the beer barns and the big rock venues were starting to close down. Yeah, okay. And so I think, you know, Scott and I were kind of like talking and it's like, you know what, it just seems that something's happening here in this, in this environment. You know, there's some kind of live thing going on that wasn't there before. It wasn't there like two years ago. And, and so we kind of, you know, we, got, we, we just had a, a good chat about stuff in general. We just found that we had similar tastes and lots of things. And, and then likewise, I ended up doing a duo with Rick Robertson, who's a sax player in Dig yeah. at another occasion. Okay. So because of this guy, Paul Meter, who was like, you know, he, he was like a total hustler. He was just getting duo trio gigs everywhere. Like I couldn't, I didn't, he, must, he just walked into places and charmed people, you know? Um, and, and then he'd sort of like, sometimes he'd have two or three gigs on in, on the same night and he'd just, he just farmed them out to people. So, yeah, so I ended up playing like, a gig with Scott and a gig with Rick. And and then we just, um, like, that all just led to the to the early to the early formation of Dig. And um, because of this nightclub connection, we sort of got to know a few of the DJs. And also Andy Glitter, who was um, a Triple J DJ, uh, heard us. We did a, we did a, a, a launch for the... English label Talking Loud, which was kind of like an acid jazz yeah, yeah. label. Know that label well. Yeah, and so and we played. It was in the Piccadilly Hotel in King's Cross, and the funny thing was, it's like nobody really heard of this sort of music much, and there weren't that many people there. But out of the people that were there, there were about like there was a lot of movers and shakers. You know, there was like Andy Glitter was there, uh, Stephen Ferris, the DJ, was there. Um, Scott Pullen was there, as I recall, and there was a whole lot of people who were trying to sort of make this music sort of happen in Sydney, and they heard us, and they went, oh, wow, there's a band playing this stuff live. So we immediately kind of got accepted by them, um, and and so they went, oh, well, I'm, I've got this night on at, you know, Kinsella's or wherever, or, uh, you know, and why don't you come play there? And so we we kind of just we just hit the right thing at the right time because, and Andy Glitter, of course, was quite influential. He was actually running live at the wireless on Triple J and he had his, he had his kind of dance uh, show later on. So he started, he started actually kind of semi managing us there for a while. He was kind of so enthusiastic that he kind of started booking us into places. So, and he said, why don't you guys record? So we kind of made some demos and he played them on the radio and he, we did it. He got live at the wireless and, and we started playing a regular Sunday night Kinsella's. That was when Kinsella's was a venue. Um, yeah, okay. I think it's more of just a bar now. Right. Um, but um, so that there was like an upstairs theatre, and there was a downstairs where bands played, you know, almost every night of the week at that point. And then at one point, the the middle level had some live music on too. So even though like the live music scene was kind of winding down for for rock and roll, um, for kind of funky music. And groove music, it was just, it just seemed to be just kind of taking off. Uh, except the venues had changed. Now it was more nightclubs and bars. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I remember places like, um, I mean, even the Harborside Brasserie um, started becoming a home to some of that stuff as well. Hey, sorry, you just cut out there for a sec. What, what was that? Oh, I'm saying, I, I remember, yeah, places like the Harborside Brasserie as well. Um, uh, there was a place on, uh, on Hunter Street. I can't remember the name, but yeah, there was a lot of, well, like, a lot of room for this stuff. Well, yeah, because the thing was, like, 
I think everything sort of coincided, you know, like the nightclubs decided that a bit of some sort of live component wasn't such a bad idea. Uh, the jazz clubs kind of went, well, our traditional jazz is not really attracting a huge crowd, but there's this stuff that's called acid jazz, which is kind of funky, so we could put that on a Friday or Saturday night. Uh-huh. Yep. And that could, um, you know, so we, we were really lucky, right time, right place. Um, but the thing was, it's like, um, we, um, we, yeah, we were doing this regular gig at Kinsella's on a Sunday, kind of early evening Sunday. It was first of all, it was like you know, it was like the Spinal Tap thing. It was like puppet show and because <laughs> it was kind of like at first we we're like it was like pool comp and dig, um, you know. <laughs> but eventually it was sort of became dig and pool comp. Yeah, nice. You know? And then nice. and then pool comp was kind of like it's, it was still there, but it was like the place was absolutely jam packed wow. and. Um, and yeah, so we we tried to get a raise from. Um, I think we we're all getting paid thirty five dollars each or something like right, that. Right. Yeah. And we we're absolutely filling the room, and we asked for a little bit more, and they were like, "Oh, you know, can't believe you do, you're asking for more money." It's like you know, um, but so, but we we were attracting like three hundred people into a room that used to have seven people in it. Yeah. Right. So anyway, you know that that's just that's that's um. That's just the the constant battle between bands and venues. Yeah, really. yeah, still still <laughs> running. <laughs> That's amazing. I um yeah, like I said, I love those records. I um I conduct a, a high school jazz band and we do an arrangement of um the favorite. So it's it's it was a lot of fun um transcribing your your guitar parts, those really cool comping parts and uh, I think I got the woodwinds yeah, to look right. after those oh, parts. Yeah, you know, like that. I must say that we got every now and again we used to get sort of uh, I guess I was going to say emails, but I don't know if emails were sort of at the early part of the nineties. Email was still so we must have gotten like messages or letters or and then later emails. But a lot of high school kids are kind of like saying, "Yeah, I'm doing you know doing a song of yours for the HSC." And wow, awesome. so we were actually really popular with that age group as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it was it, we had a really wide. Um, variety of listeners i i remember we had um because the thing was i think we appealed to um a certain type of kid especially ones that wanted to learn uh, a musical instrument because it's kind of like we were we we're on the radio but we weren't yeah. like rock and roll so if yeah. you're a sax player like a lot of bands would have been like well where's the sax you know like or where's the trumpet or you know um but with dig it was like ah oh, okay there's some there's some there's a saxophone in there or you know or people are taking solos and I can kind of like, you know, try that out. Um, yeah. Well, a lot but of we also stuff. had like this kind of groovy sort of crowd who were kind of like the dance kind of music followers who were kind of like, oh, acid jazz is like the latest kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and we can all be groovy and sort of, you know, like summer of love sort of <laughs> stuff and, and, and kind of jazz, you know, beboppy is <laughs> like beatniks, you know, the whole, the whole kind of gamut of kind of, fashionistas I suppose at the time yeah yeah and but then we had like we had the 40 somethings um who were like who who were kind of into who had been into Herbie Hancock and Miles and all that kind of funky George Duke and Zappa and you know all that kind of stuff and they kind of heard us and thought oh that's pretty interesting you know um because we did like we improvised a lot but we also had like you know there was we had an amazing drummer obviously Terrify Richmond yeah yeah so like it didn't really matter what we did in some ways it was like <laughs> just rhythmically it like people just loved it you know yeah, and got yeah. excited by it yeah no it's very cool very um i mean to hear great playing over danceable grooves and i guess for the young players i mean a lot of it was modal so um I mean, like kind of like Miles' um, kind of blue era, you know. That in the same way that turned a lot of people musicians on because they could sort of they could connect yeah. with it. It wasn't it wasn't totally a foreign jazz language, but then you guys could stretch it out into those areas when you wanted to. It was an exciting time. Well, that's right. I mean, we had. Um, I mean, basically, our, our sort of the way that we structured everything is basically we had parts, um, and we'd sort of play um, sections. And then we would come to a, a part that we knew was either a solo or it was kind of had some sort of improvised section, you know, because sometimes we'd play as a group improvising rather than just like solo. But 
more more solos than anything, I guess. And um, but I guess what set us apart from some of the, the <laughs> excuse me, some of the kind of jam bands was that I think I think an important part of keeping keeping the momentum going was always knowing where you're heading. Mm-hmm. So if you're opening up a section and you and you really are just going to go where you know where the music takes you, um, the only problem with that is if you don't really know where you're going or where you're finishing up or where you're trying to get to, you have the danger that sections like that can sort of peter out and just die away. But we basically knew where we were going, so that it was yeah, kind of like okay. a gear, it was like a gear thing, you know, where you kind of you just you're playing, you're improvising. But you know where you're heading, so at a certain point we were aware that okay, we've just got to ramp up here because the next section is more intense, um, and then bang, you'd be into that section. And it's amazing how people um, react to that sort of thing. It's like you'd sort of like play in one gear, and then suddenly, and then you know where second year is going to be, and then you know you're cueing each other, you know, visually or whatever mm-hmm. it might be, or just or some sort of drum thing might happen. And then bang, you go into it, and it's kind of like you can see it in people's faces. It's like magic. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> how did they do that? You know, it's like, well, <laughs> it's actually not that hard if you think about it. But, but, but we did have that place to go because I think a lot of some bands sort of, and I, I've experienced this on jam sessions where, like, you know, you're getting quite intense. But of course, how are you going to communicate to everybody what's next? Um, so if you don't all hit it at the same time, you sort of lose the effect of the build up if if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, oh, definitely, yes. Yeah. So I think that's what we always were very careful about. We, like, we would, like, spend, obviously, a lot of the gig would be would be sort of um, fresh, you know, because it was improvised. But we'd all we'd always know where the next section was going or, or where it was, you know, what it was going to be. Yeah, nice. And Terrify was a machine, you know, <laughs> in, in many ways. Like, I mean, I, I do. I do remember that there was an odd gig where we actually sort of improvised, and we just went, we went, you know, for ten minutes or something on a section. And I'm thinking, you know, surely we should just end this now. <laughs> surely, like that's enough, you know, like because it's like I was sweating and I was thinking that's got to be enough, you know. I'm sure the terrapa is just going to cue in the the head at the end, but no, he'd always go to the next section that was meant to be there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And it was like, yeah, he was really sort of. He was really just disciplined about that stuff. There were times when I think, oh, sure, no, you can't possibly, <laughs> we cannot possibly go through all of that now after we've just done that. But yes, you know, that's what we do. Um, so I think that's, you know, that was, um, I think we found a good balance there between improvised sort of sections and um, and written sections. Yeah, cool. Nice one. Now, so but I the... think what, but what, what, got, what got me into that, I suppose, is, yeah, you, you're kind of mentioning the Miles kind of blue and all that and that whole model thing and you know and we were also influenced by the later miles bands like the the electric ones yeah 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 like and bitches course, brew kind of stuff yeah yeah that was kind of something that was kind of the idea of that was in there and then sort of across that with sort of you know there's a lot of kind of um experimental electronic music around as well yes, so it's yeah. kind of that that really sort of and of course you know drum and bass and you know what? It was called jungle for a while, and then then it turned into drum and bass and and electronic dance music. And sort of, in a way, we we're trying to uh, like think about a lot of jazz players. They used to incorporate, you know, dance feels into their music. So even even like swing music was originally a dance groove, and then there was kind of like bossa nova, and there was um, you know Latin music and boogaloo and you know, rock feels and um, funk feels. Um, so we we're kind of, in a way, we always felt that we were being true to that tradition. Even like, so we were trying to incorporate whatever kind of new groove came out um, yeah, yeah. in the club scene. We thought, well, if we can use it, we will, you know, because we can write something around that. And yeah. that kind of kept kept us sort of relevant, I suppose. You yeah. know, and I mean, everything sort of, start not to be relevant after a period of time but but we did our best to kind of um you know kind of do what we wanted to do but also incorporate things that were sort of um that people could relate to and dance to yeah yeah but with the live band um which is so band, exciting yeah. yeah that's awesome now as you said you guys ran for what six seven years uh in the first 
uh, kind of run of dig. Once once that wound up, you you started releasing solo albums, and and you covered some maybe some similar territory to to dig, but also got stuck more into traditional jazz and blues and um, even some ambient noise kind of stuff. Um, it must have been uh, in a way liberating to be able to pursue your own your own stuff and in whichever well, way you yeah, want. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in the end, like, I think everybody, anybody who's been in the band kind of, you know, you've obviously got the really good aspects of being in the band and you've got the camaraderie and you're sort of travelling together. But then the bad aspect of being in the band is the camaraderie and the travelling together. <laughs> um, it's like, it's like a double-edged sword, you know, like you kind of, um, it's enjoyable half of the day and the other half of the day you just want to, you want to walk away from it and go, you know, you want to go to a different hotel some some days, you know, or right. you want to travel in a different car, you know, because, <laughs> you know, it's like um, there are times when you just need to, you know, think about your own thing and somebody's needling you from, you know, the back, poking you in the back or something. Or sort of, <laughs> You know, it's a it's very kind of, intense um, it, little capsule, isn't it? It is, and, pe- and different people are sort of moody at different times. And, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like it's just human nature. Yeah, know? of and course. You get course. cooped up with people, and 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 it's and it's great fun, but it's also like just really annoying, you know. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, and some, you know, sometimes somebody's in a in a in a really aggressive mood or something, and you know. But yeah, it's just the normal stuff of human relationships. I mean, you probably find the same thing, and you walk into an office, you know, a real estate office, and you probably find the same yeah, human dynamic yeah, yeah. at work. Yeah. You know, it's like it's it's just that, and um, so it, it it is kind of liberating, as you say, to kind of to do something different. And I sort of well, I did a I did an album towards the end of the nineties. It was um, I was kind of lucky. I kind of convinced. Because Dig was doing so well, I, I, it wasn't that hard to convince the label to sort of to to um, to to let me record. Like they sort of basically sponsored an album. Um, but funny thing about that was the day after the album launch, they dropped Dig. So that album was never really sort of oh, okay that well that well publicised. It's sort of by they just the relationship had just come to an end, and it was almost like I think they were actually waiting for that to happen. Um, <laughs> waiting for the actual release um like the, the launch um and then it was kind of the very next day they just the sort of the relationship came to an end yeah excuse me i've got some dust in my nose here um so yeah so that that was that one um that was called cause and effect and mm-hmm. that had some great players on it I had lloyd swanson on bass and barney mccall on Keys and uh, Toby Hall on drums and uh, little guest spots from Phil Slater on trumpet and little guest spot from um, Terrapie Richmond on on drums on on one track and um, yeah and then now I sort of a couple of years after that I went to the states for a year and a half and um, uh, and then sort of that was you know that obviously that was a Pretty amazing experience, and saw lots of great music there. Came back, it was almost like starting again, actually, because wow. Dig had wound down, and I sort of came back to Sydney, and um, a lot of the people I'd sort of been working with, uh, some of them had moved moved away. Some of them had, um, you know, if you create a gap somewhere, somebody will fill it. So sure. you know, sort of people that I used to play with, maybe doing wedding gigs or whatever that sort of thing somebody else had sort of stepped into that gap and been doing it for a couple of years. So it's kind of like I was, I was now depping in my, in bands that I used to be part of and, you mm-hmm. know, and, um, yeah. So, so then I sort of, I got a job teaching at AIM for a while. Yep. Um, and, um, which turned into, uh, after, after that one, I went to a place called AMPA, A-M-P-A or, Oh yeah, used to be called, used to be called AICM, and then it changed to Amper. And yeah, then, um, is that at Roselle? I think I've yeah, I'm aware of that moved, place. It's, yeah. it's moved now, but it was that's where it was when I was there. Um, yeah. Do you enjoy teaching? Yeah. Um, I do to a degree. Like um, at one point, I was doing three days a week at AIM, and and quite honestly, it seemed like I'd finish on the third day, and then I'd wake up the next day and 
and the first day would be back again. Like <laughs> that's how quickly the four yeah, days yeah. in between used to go. Yeah. And um, so I'm kind of a, I, I do actually like teaching, um, but I don't like to do a lot of it. Sure. Um, I've actually got a perfect situation right now. I'm teaching online with Central Queensland Uni. Oh, okay. And yep. uh, I'm just doing five hours a week, but I do it from home. Nice. Um, and yeah, that's I couldn't think of a better a better way to do it at the moment. But um, yeah, so I'm not sort of um, yeah, I'm not somebody who kind of like would want to teach five days a week. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, like I certainly don't dislike it. But yep. it's um, I would rather do you know a hundred dollar gig than um, teach for a day. Yeah, you know, gotcha. Sort of thing. Just I, I would sort of, I would find that a little bit more kind of interesting, and you know, just feel like I, I just feel like I've got still got so much to learn. Um, and just playing is really the answer in many ways. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. Tim, can we talk about your new record? Because it's interesting talking about. Uh, yeah, all your background and, and all your different experiences. The, the new record's called Old New Blues, and it's very much, um, well, what's what it says on the tin, really. It, it's uh, There's a lot of blues stuff going on, but you, you, you do manage to incorporate a lot of really interesting um, things which, which uh, you know, are apparent from from your, your upbringing and, and your, your, your career to date. Um, can you, what, what was the... What was the inspiration to take it in more a more of a blues direction for this record? Um, well, you know what I think this is this is the the recording that I'm most happy with, um, and I'm not just saying that because it's the new one. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, because yeah. you know sometimes I do finish an album and I'm like, ah, oh, probably maybe that wasn't quite the you know I, I kind of had some doubts. I mean, as as you every person who's in any form of arts I think does you've got to have self doubt here and there or just wondering whether you did the best you could have done. Yeah. Or, okay. Um but on this one, um I sort of felt it was the most personal recording because I kind of just did what I do. Um and as a result I'm sort of the most happy with this album out of anything because it wasn't too kind of pre produced or or post produced. Mm-hmm. It, yeah. Really, in, in in it wasn't at all like if I did like a couple of things I semi orchestrated in that it's a trio recording, Steve Elphick on double bass and Toby Hall on drums. Yeah, but um, I um, I basically just we just played. I didn't overdub anything, um, except just to kind of slightly kind of orchestrate or fill things out. So there's a couple of tracks where I've kind of put some uh, like a rhythm acoustic okay. on them. Yeah. But I kind of tried to stay really true to it. So what I did was I kind of like I did it straight away. Like I um, played, you know, we might have done two takes or sometimes we did three takes, and I'd kind of go, okay, I'm just, I had listened to them and I go, right, that's the best one. Like the second one's the best one. So then I went back in the studio, picked up the acoustic, and just had one go at doing the rhythm. Yeah. Okay. So I kind of kept it. I just tried to keep it as kind of. Um, vibey as possible you know and just keep keep true to that thing of um just basically playing you know the way i play yeah i mean it is weird though you know sometimes i did three takes and two of them were crap you know (laughs) or you know in my head and then the third one was like okay yeah good that's all right um and it's funny how on the same day you can it just shows you that a live performance can be so variable Mm -hmm. um but um, yeah, so but yeah, I tried to keep it sort of like so I weren't kind of like hammering one track for like two hours or something. Go, I've got to get it right. I've got to get it right. Sure, I just, sure. There are mistakes on there for sure, but you know, I think the overall. So in that in that sense, I'm really kind of happy with that. I think well, at least I've got something down that kind of shows basically what I do. Um, the other thing about it is that I've actually recorded some standards, and that's in a way that's sort of what I've been doing a lot in the last you know, 15 or so years. I mean, mm-hmm. um, I've been doing lots of jazz gigs and um, and playing standards. And, you know, I don't really normally record that sort of thing. And yet that's kind of what I do on a week-to-week basis. So again, I've sort of just picked stuff that, I, that I've that i done quite a lot of. Um, I wrote a couple of new things, uh, which are on there. Um, 
one of them was kind of inspired by another band that I'm playing in called the Greasy Chicken Orchestra, uh, which is like playing a lot of 1930s um, style music, but um, with a kind of, you know, like a sort of contemporary sensibility. Oh, cool. Um, and, um, and that's kind of called Rag Lament because it just, it just felt like a sort of, the sort of thing that maybe that band, you know, could play. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, great track. And also, you know, again, it was like one of those things where it's, I've always kind of liked, I remember I was, you know, a big fan of the Scott Joplin sort of piano stuff. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you know, so like, that the sort of chordal thing, the way they use chords in that music is just beautiful, I think. Um, so there was that, and there was a couple of other new new, new ones. And um, But then I also recorded things that I'd, like, there's a couple of tracks on there that I actually only just recorded two or three years ago on the, the album Nitty Gritty. But that was more of a, a band with keys, and that was a little bit more kind of, like, more of a funky style. More groove kind of oriented, yeah, yeah, more, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. And so I kind of had like, I just thought, look, I'm just going to do those tracks again because um, I think when I when I do it as a trio, it's just going to be totally different. Mm -hmm. um, so um, so yes, yeah, so in a way, it just kind of brings all these strands together. Yeah, absolutely. And there was even like a couple of tracks. I wasn't going to. It's like there's 14 tracks on the album, and I wasn't. I was really only going to have about 10, but I just thought, look, I'll just I'll go in there and record as many as possible, and I'll just pick the best 10 or whatever. But then when I listened to it, I thought, actually, this, to me, this kind of works as a whole. It's like, it's almost like, here's my guitar life on, a, on an album sort of thing. It's got, it's got all the elements, you know. Um, uh, let me, let me uh, ask you about a couple of tracks then. Because, um, yeah, as I said, yeah, um, it, it's interesting to work backwards in a way because I wanted to talk about the new record, but finding out about your where you've come from is really cool. So what if, what if I mention a few tracks and I'll, I'll get you to comment on those. So um, sure. Old King Soul, love that. Love that track. There's a really cool guitar and bass kind of unison riff. And then I was really digging your soloing over one chord. Again, that's you know, kind of. Again, that's a, that's a kind of a dig thing too, isn't it? Where um, we used to kind of like sort of play, um, you know, a lot. As you say, it was kind of modal and it was kind of often over one chordal centre. Um, so, you know, I think that it's a, it's a good thing. I mean, I love playing over chords and harmony because I find that really interesting, and um, and also like. You know, it's because I'm not like a, a super chops sort of guy. So um, when, um, it, if I'm sort of like playing over chords, the chords lend a certain kind of background sure. to what you're doing. Okay, yeah. So you can kind of like, you know, like the mel melodies and things can, can arise from that progression. Um, when you're playing over one chord, of course, you've got it. But, you know, the challenge there is to kind of create something that's almost like compositional. Or textural or mm -hmm. whatever, yeah, however sure. you want to describe it, because yep. it's like you, it's like a blank canvas, really, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. And, wow. and even if the, even if the, you know, even if the chord says D seven on the chart or whatever, I mean, if it's a trio, and nobody's playing chord, it's kind of like you, you can actually sort of veer from that as well. So it's almost like you've got a whole twelve tone yeah, possibility wow. there. Wow. Um, so, and that's how I tend to approach it these days. I mean. I think I used to sort of think more about the actual chord and just never really vary from that. But, but more as time goes on, I kind of think, well, really, sort of, if you can, anything can, anything can work. It's, I mean, the challenge is to make it work, mm -hmm. and 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 hopefully just not stick to always to what you know or what or what you know you might have learned twenty years ago when somebody said, if you see a D seven chord. It's D mixolydian, yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. or it's D altered if you want to get a crazy sound, yeah, or, yeah. or it's, you know, or you could use this, or you could use that. Because I sort of think now, all right, what it's about is composition on the fly, you know, and it's, 
if you can hear a certain sound, great, you know, and if you can identify that sound in your head based on what you've studied or or played, that's great. But don't you don't have to feel necessarily bound by a certain theory. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that that theory is kind of there to for you to discover how how to make something work. But you know, in the end, um, there's no there's no there's no uh, formula. I, I so think- um, yeah. At this stage of your playing, is that like an instinctual thing, I, I guess? Um, well, I, I'd like to think it becomes that after yeah. a while, right? I mean, um, I think, you know, look, I'm a, I like to think about stuff, you know, <laughs> maybe too much. Uh, you know, like, you know, I used to be called a bit of a dreamer um, as, a, as a kid. <laughs> uh, I used to read a lot and listen to music a lot and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, you can kind of like, you can get too much inside your own head. Um, I mean, that's the beauty about, playing live as well I mean that sort of just getting out and sort of night after night and playing to an audience I mean just kind of it gets you right out of that and and it's kind of like they're there they're just kind of wanting you know like they're just they're listening to what's going on and you're thinking right okay I'm on the spot here I've just got to I've got to do something you know like there they are here I am and it's kind of my responsibility to kind of make something happen here. Yeah, yeah. And, or at least kick it off, you know, because it's uh-huh. always a circular thing, I think, with an audience, you know, like the more that they get inspired, the more that you get inspired. So, I mean, it's, but it's finding the way into that, isn't it? It's like how to, how, to, how to kind of move them to a degree that they're actually into what you're doing. And then, um, and then that is inspiring in itself. Um, but, yeah, so but back to the question, I guess... Um, not that I can remember what the question is at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it was more just saying, yeah, is that an instinctual thing when you're, you're painting all these yeah, different yeah, yeah. tonal colours on top of a... Yeah, well, I, I mean, look, I do a bit of teaching and I think I think that instinct thing is just something that just comes from, um, like, it's just, it's thinking things through, it's repetition, it's um, it's doing it in front of an audience. It's like, it's like, it's like practising all those elements. And mm-hmm. I always say to students, it's kind of like, you know, when you when you're driving your car, it's kind of like you don't think, okay, now with my right hand I'm going to turn the wheel towards the right, and with the left hand that will follow. Same time as that, I'm going to slightly depress the brake because I want to slow down just before I make that turn, and then I press the accelerator. At the mo- you know, you don't sort of you don't break it down like that. Like yeah, when you're sure. first learning to drive, you kind of all completely uncoordinated, and you know you just can't sort of you. You know, you press the brake when you're meant to press the accelerator. You, you know, you you sort of you look, you know, you turn your head around to look to see what's coming, and you suddenly find yourself that you've actually changed lanes because your 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 head <laughs> while you've turned your head, your 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 arm has sort of come down and the wheel has turned yep, and yep. all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. It's like um, it's just really difficult. But if in the but in the end, like you know, when you've been driving for like ten years or something, like it's instinctual, right? You just you kind of make these little sort of all your movements are much smaller, you know, like you're, you're glancing in the mirrors pretty much all the time. You, you've got, you know, you're always kind of prepared for what might happen. Um, and I think music's kind of like that too. Like you, you practice all the scenarios, you kind of, you play stuff, you find what you like, you develop a sound based on things that you like and, and you sort of think, no, if I was to be doing a solo over a, a D7 chord, yeah. what kind of thing would I do? If it was minor, would I? How would I? You know, and um, you know, you kind of you break down chord progressions. You go, oh, I've got a two five one thing happening here. Like, have I got some licks for that, or 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 can I just can I just kind of wing it? Like, or it's like, and then it's all in relation to what's just happened. I think you know, so you can't just be tunnel visioned when you're playing. You you can't. You can't just go, right, I'm going to play lick number five now and then I'm going to play lick number ten. And then, then you know, um, you've kind of got to, you play something. Well, in my mind, anyway, you play something and then that becomes, that's the beginning of what you're doing. The next thing should not just be separate to that. Mm-hmm. The next thing is informed by that first thing. So, you know, that's how you develop some sort of compositional quality to it. Yeah, okay. Because, you know, like you, you play something and then you, um, the next thing is a development of that. It's not like a completely separate thing, or it shouldn't be. Um, I, I heard, I read the thing that Herbie Hancock 
said once where he he said sometimes when he's playing he just put he just randomly puts his fingers down on the keyboard and whatever that sound is he develops that sound in relation to what's going on so it's kind of like it's almost like this huge it could be a huge dissonant chord but then he'll just change a note and then change another note and then the line that he plays on top of that chord will obviously reflect that dissonance um so just an interesting concept, wow, I thought, yeah, where, yeah, yeah. you know, where you're kind of like, you, in other words, you're just totally in the moment, um, but in the moment that's informed by what's happened and what's going to come, you know, so I think you're balancing those those three gray areas, so to speak. Yeah, um, yeah. Wow, that's very Shades cool. of gray and music, I don't know. But, you know, the, the um, yeah, so I think you're kind of in, in the middle. I mean, sometimes I kind of hear people, you know, because... I have, you know, I've heard all sorts of people playing, obviously, over time. You, you go to all concerts and you hear, like, hear some of the, the masters at work and then you hear somebody down the local pub at work and then, you hear, you know, you go to a jazz gig and you hear somebody like a new guitarist you've never heard before or, or any instrument for that matter. But um, And sometimes, you know, I get a little bit sort of analytical and I kind of think, wow, this player just sounds like they're playing ideas that they've practiced, they've really rehearsed the ideas, and it sounds a little bit out of time, or, or not really, not really with the rhythm section, because it's kind of like it's almost like they're shutting themselves off to what's going on around them. Like they're not playing within the rhythm yeah, okay. of the other players. So I look, I'm not saying that I can avoid all that stuff because um, I think I I think I recognise these things because I'm often guilty of it. But um, but I think ideally I would love to to sort of be able to not to not be too um not have too many sort of um preemptive ideas in my head like mm -hmm. not in other words like i think you've got to have licks to a degree but if you can just play it in a different way or you can develop something from that it's a better way to do it than it is just to just to, to sort of you know play by numbers so yeah, to speak yeah yeah sure um because that always sounds to me to be a bit stilted and a bit sort of it's kind of like constantly finishing almost it's like at the end of every lick there's like a there's a finishing point um whereas a kind of a solo to me should flow uh, if possible from one end to another so how do you develop that sort of um quality to your playing cuz as you know as beginners you know kids we learn licks we learn our favorite licks we try well, and show exactly, everyone yeah. that we can play on how do you get beyond that yeah yeah well i think i don't know like it is hard, isn't it? It would be different for everyone, but I think at some point, you kind of got to lose the ego of that. I mean, I mean, if if you have if you have like the sort of gift of, um, you know, having like really amazing technique, um, it it would be, and and you learn like a whole lot of licks, and and they're all like super kind of high quality kind of licks, you know, where they're all kind of like really interesting. I mean, it's hard. I mean, I guess that particular person would have to sort of think, oh, maybe I should just drop the ego a little bit and just sort of, and not try to kind of, not try to be the, um, uh, to impress people quite so much. Yeah, yeah. You know, maybe I should try, uh, do my best to kind of just hear something, like, you know, like just go the other way for a while, like try to sort of like, am I hearing these notes or am I just playing them? You know, like I think that's an important aspect to it sure um, yeah so like sometimes you know some people have to kind of like to some degree have to kind of uh stop stop and think about like what they're doing with their technique um i've always kind of struggled to a degree to kind of to get whatever technique that i've got uh, because i say it was kind of like lazy particularly as a younger player um i was almost kind of like just trying to play play more uh, melody and sort of those sort of things but um you know so it's really um as i say like it's it's all the elements that you that you you know it, it is it is repetition and practice um it is thought process i guess and and try to sort of try to hear when a band's really kind of grooving and also like just mega point would be listening to the people around you mm -hmm. yeah yeah, and you know what I mean. You know, it's like if you have a, con a conversation between yeah. three or four people around a table. I mean, let, let's just say that they're all 
playing guitar and not talking, but they're actually talking, right? So one guy or girl is sitting there just constantly talking, you know, just won't stop. Um, and, um, you know, and then, and then maybe somebody else just kind of listens thoughtfully to what's going on and then puts in a few words here and there. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, a great analogy. You know, and adds to the conversation. In other words, like, you know, doesn't, um, and then maybe somebody else's kind of tech, you know, thought process is to kind of, to be ag- maybe aggressive and, and say constantly sort of go, ah, oh, no, that's not right. That's not right. You know? So, um, I think you have all those personalities at play in, in, in music too, like sort of, so, you know, I think, you know, the, the person who, who's constantly playing 16th notes at high velocity and licks is kind of like the person who never stops talking. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. And, and then there's the other person who kind of like just adds tasteful licks here and there and not really concerned about soloing, just wants to make the music sound good, you know? Yeah. And then there's the other person who might like soloing, but, but maybe also likes, conversation you know so they'll kind of add they'll sort of like speak up but they won't sort of get in the way of anybody else talking so much you know it's mm-hmm. like they'll add to it or contribute to it and or um you know and encourage other people that's yeah that's a great a great analogy the whole conversational yeah. thing yeah and I, I kind of regard music as a is has that element to it or, or should in my book i'm not saying that's true for everyone because, you know, like there's all sorts of styles of music out there and there's all sorts of types of people and it's all pretty valid. But, you know, like, but you were saying, well, how would I reach the point that I want to reach? Well, I would, that's how I would approach it and that's how I have approached it. It's kind of like I practice things by repetition. I play things. I do my best to listen to what's happening around me and I do my best to react to that and sort of contribute to it. Um I must say sometimes it's hard to play with people if if everyone else is only concerned with their own thing. Um, sure, you yeah. Know, like it's hard for me to step yeah. out in front of that because mm-hmm. that's not the type of player that I've ever been really, you know, a dominating force kind of thing. Um, so really I try to, you know, do my best. Oh, there's the other thing, of course, is picking the people that you play with that allow you to do what you want to do. Yeah, yeah. You know, because it's like it's like a, casting a movie or something. If you don't get the right actors, it's not really going to work. You know, um, so I think that with musicians, like if you if you find people that allow you to do what you do, then that's 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 gold. You know, that's really precious. Like, and as time goes on, you find those people, and you just hope they're they're available. You know, when when the when the gigs come up, so. Um, yeah, so that's the thought process, I guess. Is also, yeah, you know, okay. like finding the right people to play with, like one, the ones that sort of allow you to do what you do. Because I'm not saying it's a, it's, it's, it's something that people do on purpose, but there are people that I played with. I just find it hard, difficult to actually fit in to what they're doing. You know, it's like there's, to me, it's like, well, they're really busy, or they, I don't quite get rhythmically what they're what they're doing. Like they they don't seem to be listening to me. Um, I must say the opposite extreme of that is, you know, when people kind of maybe they're listening a bit too much to what you're doing and they're kind of co- emulating it okay. or copying yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you've experienced that, but like that's kind of can get get quite sort of distracting. You know, when you you're sort of playing something and you and you do something rhythm, rhythmically, and then suddenly maybe the piano player what as he starts emulating that rhythm, and then. Okay, so you back away from that, you try something else, and suddenly they're on that. <laughs> um, and it's kind of like, well, hang on a sec, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a bit of space around that. I, you know, we don't all have to do that. So, you know, like, yes, you just got to find people that kind of, that you can work with. Um, and sometimes it doesn't hurt to talk to people, you know, and just get a concept. You know, if, if it's not really working, but you feel like it could work, sometimes uh, you can just kind of like talk about it and sort of say, look, you know, I really don't like it when you sort of jump on everything I do. Um, and sometimes it's like to them, it's like, oh, oh, okay. I thought you'd like that, you know, like, yeah, okay, cool. I won't do that again, you know, and it's, yeah. it's actually not a problem. You know? Sure. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. look, there's so many elements out there. I mean, Absolutely. it's really hard to, yeah. Let's, um, I've got to wrap up in a little while. Can we, let's um, talk about a couple more tracks from the record. Um, yeah. 
Now, you mentioned playing a bunch of standards on the record, and there's some really great, great ones on there. One of the most compelling ones, for me anyway, was Dark Was the Night, the, the blues standard. Um, and you approach this in a really interesting way. There's um, some really trippy textures, some, some ambient kind of textures, which you've, you've definitely explored in other albums. Um, in fact, uh, your album U Tunes, the, the tracks before and after, the, the bookends. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it was reminiscent of that for me, which I love those tracks too. Tell me, the, tell me your background and, and why you thought Dark Was the Night needed this kind of approach. Okay, well, it's funny because this one had a bit more of a kind of um, an, a non-musical kind of, uh, like mixing a musical concept with a non-musical one. Um, the, the sort of non-musical thing was, uh, I found it really interesting that that track, which I, I like, the original version, um, I was reading about it and I found out that it's on that gold album that put onto the, uh, I think it's a Voyager 1 spacecraft, which came into the news a couple of years ago because I think it kind of left our... It was the first man-made object that left, left our solar system. And as and that was the night cold was the ground. Um, the blind Willie Johnson version um, was actually one of the tracks they picked as, you know, if some future alien civilization ever... You know, maybe a, a future alien civilization with a turntable. Um, if they sort of... <laughs> Listen to all the track, you know, I think there was like Bach and Mozart on there. Yeah, and, yeah. And some kind of like music from around the world and, and you know, and, and this blues, this kind of... But I thought it was like perfect for an um, instrumental version too because there's really, there's really no lyrics in it. It's just this kind of really mournful... I don't know, just... It's kind of music that sort of makes the hairs on, on my neck stand up kind of thing. It's one of those sort of tracks, you know, it's like... Um, one of those things where you know you get into music because of how how it makes you feel and you just want to be part of it, and that's one of those tracks. And just the fact that it was kind of out there in space somewhere, it's so so. I kind of like put those two things together, and I basically I um I kind of got two looping pedals and and a couple of distortion pedals, and I just improvised like a a background, mm -hmm. which I thought was kind of reminiscent of like static or something like a space kind of vacuum sort of sound i don't know just like random noise and um and then we um so i did like about you know five minutes of that and then we kind of i got guys to come back in the studio and we just kind of played the song like i didn't really sort of do anything other than i just i transcribed bits of the melody and just basically wrote them down because i didn't want to kind of veer too far away from the original melody. I just wanted to pick all my favourite bits. Yeah, okay. and just and just play them. I just wanted to be just have that strength. I didn't want to sort of start improvising around it. I just wanted to kind of really just play it, you know. Um, and I kind of um, got Toby on drums. I kind of wanted that sort of late period John Coltrane, Elvin Jones thing, where the drums just kind of playing mallets and just sort of. Um, playing sort of like just ebb ebbing and flowing with the melody rather than actually playing a groove. Yeah, yeah. And the same with the bass, you know, it's kind of like just playing sort of with the guitar or playing with the melody and the drummer and just kind of ebbing and flowing. And um, so we just had two points there where it was kind of like the, the root note. And then at a certain point, I kind of visually cued to go to the, to the fifth, you know, and just, and that was like the tension and release, yeah, okay. which which is there in the original. Yeah. So um, so I don't know. It might sound a little pretentious in in a sense, but but I just kind of thought, well, it's kind of blues, but it had because of this kind of connection to outer space. Um, <laughs> I just thought, I don't know. That's how can awesome. I how can I how can I kind of achieve that in some small way? And, and that's so that was you know what I came up with. Nice, nice, very very evocative. Um, how about the track Coral Sea Gospel? Now that's one of your older um, originals that you've you've re-recorded. Yeah, is that a, yeah. a six-string banjo you're playing on that? It is. It is. Yeah. Nice. Um, so that one um, that was one of the things that I just kind of that was any time I overdub. Oh no, I overdubbed a little solo at the end of that, um, and I also overdubbed some solo on the um, Trigger Finger and that other track. And okay. But, um, yeah, so I kind of, um, well, actually, you know, the funny thing is I, I kind of used the six-string banjo and the greasy chicken orchestra being a sort of 
uh, I use guitar and banjo. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And um, so I've kind of had, had got the instrument around, and I actually really love playing it. It sounds great, like just sitting at home playing the thing. But um, I actually ordered a uh, resonator guitar from this guy, Don Don Mo, uh, Don Morrison in South Australia. Um, and I kind of thought that it, I was hoping that it would make it by the session, but it actually turned up a week later, unfortunately. Um and I was kind of going to use a resonator on, on that okay, track. Okay, okay. Um, but um, so I, um, so the original, like I, I just sort of laid down the song. Because I'd recorded it before, I just wanted to do something a little different with it. So I just, I kind of just played it over like a repetitive um, bass figure. Yeah. Because uh, I don't know how I came up with it. Um, because it, normally I don't think, like the middle section um, is kind of quite harmonically different to the, to the first section, which is kind of in the key of D. Um, but I think one day I was just kind of mucking around and I sort of realized that the middle section actually... Oh, that's right, because sometimes, like, if I, I, I've sort of messed around with a, a loop pedal on that one too and I just kind of play that rhythm. Just, like, just rhythmically on an acoustic and then playing over it. And then one day I just kind of played the middle section over that. Oh, thought, okay. Oh, it kind of works, nice. <clears throat> and it also sort of somehow brought the whole thing together. So I really wanted to kind of like have another go at recording that, just in a totally different way. So, I'd, so I got the bass figure kind of run through the whole thing, and I sort of played it on acoustic because I thought it just seemed more gentle with the repetitive figure there. And I just wanted to, I also wanted to have a bit, bit that color on the album, you know, that just wasn't all the same guitar. So I kind of like chose that one, played the melody on acoustic, and then I kind of played the rhythm at the end and then I thought it'd kind of be nice to have and I was kind of anticipating that maybe the resonator would be there and I could kind of play using that okay yeah but it didn't it didn't you know cut a lot of story short it didn't so I kind of um yeah I just I just took the banjo in and and just yeah again I just sort of thought yeah I'm just gonna have one go at this and um I don't want to kind of like get too kind of caught up in trying to make this a perfect recording you know like i just want to just just you know like just play you know just do what you do and you know and um so that yeah so but i actually yeah so i was i was quite happy with the sound of that track and the mm-hmm. banjo kind of i think you know does the same kind of job i guess that the yeah, resonator would cool. do very cool just um as a side note don mo is just a fantastic name for a guy making resonators Exactly. Uh, Dobro yeah. style guitars. I know. Well, that's yeah, pretty intention, I'm sure. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, um, actually, I've got to, um, I've got to contact him because even though the guitar didn't make it onto the album, yeah. like all the all the shots of bits of guitar are actually from that uh, from that guitar. Ah, cool. Because um, I was actually sort of playing it. I was sort of thinking, what am I going to do for the cover on this? You know, it's like at some point you have to turn your attention to that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. And I was kind of like, I was, I had this picture of a brutalist uh, like architecture poster, which I really liked. Um, it kind of like it was just two colours, or three actually, if you count, you know, black, white, and this kind of turquoisey colour, and, and this bluish colour, which is kind of white. And and I liked the lettering on it and stuff. I thought, oh, I should just kind of like use that for the cover. But uh, in, in the poster, there was also like picked like sort of grainy pictures of buildings, which were kind of part of it and I thought and what and I was kind of like just thinking about this and I was staring I was playing the Donmo and I was it's got really really um sort of chromey glassy uh tuning pegs and I was just looking I was kind of like looking past the guitar thinking and I'm just thinking about this artwork that I had to have and I and I kind of focused on the tuning pegs I suddenly realized that there was my face like <laughs> five times staring back at me and I thought what a great picture That's I've never trippy, seen man. <laughs> yeah I know I thought I've never so I kind of got the camera and then um, kind of tried to get a picture without the camera obviously yeah it wasn't that easy to do so I sort of <laughs> grabbed my partner and said can you just come and sort of step, you know maybe we just get this shot without like the camera being in it and so so the guitar kind of like that's the picture in the um, of the cover and then I needed something on the inside, and of course, oh man, those resonators look so good. Like, yeah, kind yeah. 
it was so many kind of interesting shapes. So I just took a couple of close-ups of the body, and um, and I thought, you know, well, I must let Don know that that's... <laughs> <even, laughs> it yeah. still made it onto the record. It still made it onto literally, the record. Literally, yeah. literally onto the, yeah. the cover release. What other guitars right, were you well, using for the album? Um, well, it's my trusty ES345, my Gibson, that I've had, you know, like since I left the con kind of thing. Oh, okay. Wow. Um, do you um do you do the common mod? Do you bypass the very tone or is that still Oh uh, look I functioning? bought it with my this guitar was a was a classic when I bought it because, you know, we've just kind of like gone through the sort of the uh, late seventies kind of um, you know, Larry Carlton and Lee Rittner and Yeah, yeah. And all and, and I cool. think even Robin Ford and people like that are all playing three three fives, you know, at yep. that time. John Schofield, I think, he even had one um, before he kind of got the deal with Ibanez. Yeah, and yeah. That's he, right. um, so I was kind of like, I was so keen to find one, you know. And, and then and another guy at the con um, had got one. And I, I'd sort of, at the time, I was playing a thin line telly and I had a couple of different guitars, but I, I never had the money enough to keep all these instruments, unfortunately. Every time I bought a guitar, I had kind of had to sell the yeah, previous one. Yeah, the, the classic So at that cycle. point, I had this kind of thin line telly and... Um, and this, and so this, uh, this, um, I'm just trying to think of his name actually. Uh, it'll come to me, but maybe too late. Uh, I turned up with this Cherry 335, and I'm like, oh, damn, I want one of those so much. And um, so I kind of like put some time into trying to find one. And I went into this little shop in North Sydney. I, I, I was looking for, you know, quite some time. And um, this guitar was hanging on the wall, and, um, yeah, as I say, it was classic because it was it was that period, and there was like a sort of a badass bridge on there, and the, you know, which was peeling peeling off. <laughs> it was like gold gold hardware, like on, and some of it was silver, and some of it was gold. Yeah, right. There was like you know, big chunky, thick goto sort of or grover, like grover tuners, like all with with the sort of fake gold paint just kind of starting to peel yeah, off, and yeah. <laughs> you know, and like a really sort of cheap bridge on there, and. Uh-huh. And um, and the very tone switch had been uh, sort of this. I thought it was taken out because I had a guy looked at it and went, "Oh no, the switch isn't there." Um, so I just kind of assumed that was the case, and um, and so I kind of like over over time, I just had stuff replaced, and you know, and kind of I kind of got some tuners that more resembled the originals, and etc. Mm-hmm. etc. Et kind of I basically replaced everything except for the pickups in you know over the time that I've had it. Um, and um, it was only recently that somebody said, said, oh, do you want me to connect up the very tone? You know, and I went, ah, oh, but it's not there, is it? I said, the switch is there, but the, oh, no, it's all under there. It just, huh. just has been disc. Wow. Well, no. I said, you know what? No, I don't. Because <laughs> I, there's, there's too many variables as it is. You know, like yeah, yeah. Every room sounds different. Every yeah. amp sounds different you know like i've got i've got three positions switch as it is and sometimes i can't even decide which one of those to use <laughs> just imagine sort of putting another five or six yeah, options on absolutely. the table and you know it's kind of like yeah i don't know about that yeah oh, um, that's cool so, so that guitar's kind of been with me for a long time but nice. recently i bought a um an arch top uh an eastwood you know chinese oh uh, yeah yeah guitar. yeah and i love it it's on a couple of tracks on on the album nice um, and it absolutely sounds great recorded. Like I think it sounds even better recorded than it does live because live it's sort of um, it's hard to kind of get it to a volume level. You know that's sort of in certain circumstances sure. um, before taking. But um, yeah, yeah, it, it, I'm just I'm really happy with the sound like on that recording. So um, so that's basically it. I have an, I have a Maiden acoustic that mm-hmm. I, I use for acoustic on there. Um, cool. I can't. Even, I don't even know the the, um, the the number, like the the model number. To be honest, I bought it second hand. Yeah. Um, How about amps? Uh, uh, amps. Yeah. Well, on that album, I used just the one amp. Again, I just wanted to keep everything fairly simple. Yeah, sure. um, I, I've got a Fender Princeton, um, which originally I I probably had it for about eight years or so. I'm, I bought it, um, it had been reconditioned by this guy who was working at 301 Studio, but it just happened to be in Richie B's studio in uh, Chippen, uh, sorry, Camperdown. 
um, I was doing something there, and there was these, there were these two apps there, and and he's sort of going, oh, you should try one. I'm going, well, I just bought a car app, you know the car brand C A W R. Yeah, yeah. I bought a car Rambler, which is kind of like based on a Fender Deluxe sort of, but and I was just really into it. I, mean, I just bought it, and um, and I'm I'm setting this up in the studio, and and Richie's going, oh man, you should try one of these Princetons, and I'm like, I've just spent three thousand dollars on this app over here and i love it i'm looking you know, you know maybe another time and he's going oh you know so eventually at some point you know we took a break and i kind of i thought oh well you know i'll, I'll give it a go so i kind of plugged it in and went wow that's so light in comparison to my and it sounds great wow um very cool so i was sort of like i thought about it for a while because obviously you know you just don't go buying an app and then buy another one a month later you know that's just not the way yeah. it's done, unless you're some sort of you know wealthy rock star or something but um i thought oh hang on a sec like because you know like this it's been it'd be great to have an app that sounds really good but it's just not as heavy you know like just that classic sort of thing i could stick that in the boot um yeah yeah i could you know all that kind of practical stuff because and I'm, oh, I'm doing a lot of jazz gigs i don't really need the volume um you know just just rationalizing the whole thing. Yeah, like, yeah. Talking yourself into it. How am I going to yeah, talk myself into it? <laughs> Trying to talk myself out of it, but talking myself into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. As we all do. That's, <laughs> that's, that's all good. Yeah. So I kind of. Anyway, so this. Yeah, I went and tried. Um, I went. I went to visit the guy that had reconditioned it. Rick. Um, I sort of forgotten his second name right now, but he. Um, he actually played. He brought out a few amps that he'd reconditioned, and and each one I'm thinking, oh, they all sound so good. Um, <laughs> But out of the two that were in the studio, I just kind of picked. They both sounded great to me. Uh, one was in white Tolex, one was in black. And the black one was actually an actual 65 shell, like a, like oh, a cabinet. Oh, wow. That's cool. So I thought, uh, you know, like they both sound really good. I, I might just pick the one that's got the history. Yeah, with it. sure. So, the, so all, the, all the electronics were all kind of like reconditioned. Um, so it was kind of like a new amp. Um, and then... Um, a couple of years ago, I I was kind of thinking. I, I was kind of. I used to use, um, you know, unfortunately, dear friend uh, Vito Portolesi sort of passed away relatively recently. Um, he was my main kind of. He was the guy that I always went to to fix my amps. Um, I still haven't even like had anything go wrong with one of my amps yet. So I'm yet to find somebody who can you know, do the same kind of job. Mm, yeah, um, okay. But I was kind of in there and. And I had um, something, I think something needed replacing in the app. And I, and he goes, oh, yeah, I oh, know, that, that's fine. And I, he said, does, does anything else you need doing? He said, well, you know what, I wouldn't mind a, um, a reverb in there. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> the tremolo is great, but, you know, and I was kind of half joking. I said, oh, you know, uh, yeah, just a reverb and maybe just a little more clean headroom. He goes, yeah, leave it with me. Okay. So he kind of put in a little small size reverb tank and oh, nice. kind of put a re put a switch at the back so I can kind of you know like a and um and he kind of suits it up in some way. Well I didn't even know what he did to be honest. It just was just had more clean headroom. I think he sort of yeah, I think he changed it to six L sixes. But okay. I'm not exactly sure what he did and I and um I just thought oh it just sound, you know it sounds exactly what I wanted. I can't believe it. And um so that was so. So that's how that amp is now. So that's that's the amp that you heard on the, yeah, on the record. Yeah. Okay. That's everything. And I've still got the car amp, and um, and that's that's a nice amp too. And uh, you know, I've um, got a couple of you know, I've got a transistor amp which I hardly ever use, and and a couple of other little things. Um, most of the sort of stuff that I've kind of that I had lying around, I've basically recently sort of done a big clean out and sort of gotten rid of everything anything right. that I don't use so you know I've just got the essentials I've got like two two nice valve amps like a um, a Henriksen jazz amp which is oh yeah yeah is a really nice amp in itself yeah and I've nice. got a one of those new short uh, what is it sorry um, Bose battery amp it's like an S1 I think they're called and it's like the best sounding battery amp that I've ever heard um so again, it's just one of those things I just use. There are those occasions when you're doing maybe a jazz trio somewhere, and you know, it's like, oh, can you guys just play out 
yeah, in the garden okay. for a yeah, while, or you yeah, know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. And it's like, yeah. well, so I've got some, finally found something that sounds. Oh wow, sounds that's decent. cool. Yeah, because yeah, that's usually a nightmare. Um, I remember doing. Yeah. Uh, a wedding at Balmoral, and there's that beautiful little island where people get married. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Can you guys play yeah. there? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I know. I should have bought so one of those funny, I know so so many funny stories about that. I remember um, a friend of mine, Stu Hunter, the organ player and keyboard player, and he was telling me about a gig where he did where it was like, um, it's at um, a little venue, um, Nielsen Park, and they had this policy, no amplification whatsoever. But they wanted him to play an electric piano, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, if you so get brought... close to a Rhodes, you can hear it if you're really close. <laughs> well, no, yeah. but it was It was like a keyboard, you know oh, what I mean? Like, no. a, like a sort of a like a like a Nord or something okay. like that. Yeah, like yeah, one. yeah. <laughs> so, like, basically, you play it, and all you hear is the faint click of the keyboard. Mm. You know, mm. doesn't matter um, what note you play. So he kind of he kind of. He had a little battery amp in a backpack, and he uh-huh. kind of pretended that the backpack. He just put it, he put it down near the keyboard, and sort of surreptitiously plugged in. And they were, like, oh man, it was so great! And thanks for the, thanks for the acoustic uh, piano. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to be creative sometimes. That's awesome. That's awesome, Tim. It's been so fun talking to you. I, we need to wrap up, but um, la- last thing I'll ask: Are you, are you going to do any solo gigs to? promote the record or, you know, just getting out yourself as for your own. Yeah, well I mean you mean solo as in trio kind of playing the with the band. Yeah. Or do you mean yeah, yeah. Yeah, well I've got a um this I'm pretty sure this podcast will probably come out after it, but uh, next Wednesday this coming Wednesday next week sort of thing. Um twenty fourth of Wednesday the twenty fourth oh, okay, of yep. April. So I've got a C D launch um at Foundry six one six in Brilliant. Altamo. Um, and I've also just come back from a, um, I actually sort of had this kind of weird concept where I thought I was kind of very old school in a way. I sort of friends, parents were running a, a really nice little room in Sortel and also like a ex school friend. Actually the guy, one of the guys I mentioned in the podcast, Carrie Bennett, who started the young North Side big bands. He now lives in Armadale and he, he does a kind of jazz night on a Thursday night. Oh, so cool, I, I sort of went up. I drove up to Sortel and played with local musicians, and then I drove to um, Armadale and played there, and not and then Bellingen, then back to Armadale, and back back on to Sydney. And I was kind of thinking that because it's so hard to tour something, you know, that uh, you know, unless you're making like a lot of money doing what you're doing, yeah, um, sure, you know, like with, without big audiences, it's, but it's actually possible to actually drive somewhere as one person, you know play with local people and I think that's what a lot of I think that's pretty old school concept in the jazz world you know like back in the sort of uh, a long time ago people would actually do that sort of yeah, play with yeah, the, yeah. just tour and and people like Chuck Berry still used to do it a lot you know yes, so yeah. travel from town to town use local musicians and yeah. I guess the only difference was is that um, I didn't really have the sort of gumption to ask for the money up front like Chuck would you know <laughs> I, just, I hear that Chuck Berry wouldn't go on until he got paid in cash. Yeah, it's probably um, probably out of necessity gig. for for out some of, of those gigs. I'd say so. Yeah, it was either carry a gun or get the cash up front. But, right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you're not doing that. Not doing that. No, okay. but I am doing a little bit. Of, I, I'm thinking of like trying to kind of get some gigs organised where I can do a bit of yeah, touring. Yeah, great, man. Um, That's awesome. If I can take a band, fantastic. But if not, I look. I know enough people who've moved out of Sydney. Yeah. into regional areas and to Melbourne and Hobart and you know that I can kind of pretty much always find uh, people to play with so great and I thought wow I should do that you know it's like it's a, it, I didn't really take it that seriously as a, as an idea until just recently I thought I said there's no reason why that can't happen and the other good thing about this particular album is because it is half standards I kind of don't have to rehearse a whole original repertoire so I can concentrate on the yeah, original nice. that I want to play yep. and then give them a list of these standards and we can play them anyway so it's always going to be pretty fresh because it's going yeah, to depend on cool. who's playing yeah nice that seems right up your alley as well excellent um, and is timrollinson.com the best place to keep a hold of, of um, what's going on with you it's it's a, um, it's a look cool I'm not site. very good at updating it but yeah. um there's also a Tim Rollinson in brackets guitarist on 
Facebook. Okay, yep. Um, so if anybody wants to like that, um, that will be probably the, 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 the sort of thing that will be most up to date. Okay, um, yeah, sure. As far as like, you know, like being in, uh, I mean, obviously like you can be in touch through there as well, but there is yep. the, the, the website, timrollinson.com. Okay. You can actually purchase CD there if anybody's. I'm, I'm rapidly realizing though that we've kind of, we've passed a little turning point here. I, I don't think that many people, um, I mean, for a while, it's been happening for a while, but it, I almost feel like it's actually happened now. I don't think CDs are really um, something that people want to buy anymore. Yeah, it's becoming far less common, or even for people to own a CD player. Yeah, to, to actually own one, and even like even like new computers are even sort of coming out without CD drives. Without drive, so, um, yeah, yeah. You know, like it's not going to be long before it's not even technically possible for people. But you know, I, I like to think you know. You know, if you want to support an artist, and you know, and get and and help them to make the next recording, yeah, absolutely. I think you should buy the CD anyway. Yeah, yeah. And I sort of think, give it to somebody, or throw it away, or you know, or yeah. use it as a use it as a placemat. <laughs> I mean, because <laughs> it's, it's the important thing is, in a sense, is just. I mean, you can listen to it on Spotify or Apple Music or whatever, but why not support the artist at the same time? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it might have some sort of retro value in twenty years. Who knows? Who knows? Well, like I mean, the vinyl, vinyl the vinyl yeah, craze, exactly. maybe the CD craze will come yeah. back. And... Well, that's right, because it's all the boomers who are kind of like, sort of, they they have like really sort of, rem, they reminisce about vinyl. It's kind of like the people that were like um, teenagers in the CD era. They might have the same kind of emotional attachment. Yeah. And when, when, and when CDs aren't being made anymore, and, you know, most of them have been kind of pulped or, you know, sitting in landfill, they'll, you know, some of these CDs, I guess, if they're quite rare to begin with, who knows? I mean, I, I don't think anybody expected that some albums would be worth thousands of dollars, you know, down the track. But, um, but yeah, and if you, I mean, uh, the funny thing about CDs was, is that, like, you used to be able to make it, you know, burn them at home. So no big deal, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, you yeah. just kind of like copy a CD. But imagine when the technology, like, when nobody has a CD drive anymore, actual CDs could even rise in value because uh-huh. you can't make them at home anymore. So if yeah, you yeah. want, if you want to have, have a certain album in your collection, um, then maybe you would have to buy it at vastly inflated. You know, you know what I'm saying. If anybody wants to buy ten of my CDs, just as a, as an investment, they're quite. I'm quite happy to sell them. <laughs> multiple that's, copies that's yeah. a good plan that's a good plan yeah. people um i Listen think i'm up. the silly guy i told you i was a dreamer and <laughs> that's yeah very cool tim it's been All awesome right. chatting it's been amazing talking about your career and um the the new record of course and it's funny i, I feel like i've been into... talking a hell of a lot but it's funny isn't it when you, when you start talking about a whole series, series of events which would go over decades it's yeah. kind of like it's hard to shut up it's, um, that's a, there's a lot of stuff that's happened over that time for yeah. sure. I mean, it's it's that's what I love about doing this show. Sometimes I get 15 minutes with someone and it's very concise, and you only can talk about the new thing. But when when I've got a bit more time, like we've had today, I love getting the whole backstory because then the new thing um, just has a lot more depth to it. Yeah, you know, when you're listening and you understand the stories and the and the background. So I really appreciate your time, and it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's right, and I always really enjoy listening to, you know, especially if I'm if I'm into a guitarist, hearing about their background is always super interesting, you know. All right, there you go, my conversation with Tim Rowlandson, and yes, I love uh, the deep dive we get to do on the Guitar Speak podcast, so that was very cool. I'm going to get Tim to play us out with his rendition of Heya, very soulful some African influences there as well very very cool he's going to play us out hey remember to head over to guitarspeakpodcast.com for all kinds of stuff past episodes social media links t-shirts stuff you know you know the drill alright thanks for joining me I'll catch you next time